I'm now going to briefly explain some of the features of today's webinar. This webinar is being recorded. There is international sign, language interpretation in English, Chinese, and Mongolian, and CART in English. A CC button on your screen will enable the captions. If you need captions in a different window, the link is right in the chat box. Please kindly take a few seconds to enable the language of your choice in the language option, again at the bottom of your screen. There will be an option to mute original audio. Please do not select this option. If you do, you might miss some parts of the audio. So let's take a couple of seconds so we can all select this language of your choice in the language options. Should you have questions for panelists, kindly use the Q&A option or leave your questions in the chat box. Our team is monitoring both and will try to respond to questions in the course of the event where possible. We hope that we will have time for some Q&A wherein participants may be invited to ask questions Please note, we cannot put camera on for participants due to the limitations on this platform. Where time is an issue, priority will be given to answering questions that are relevant to the discussions which have been presented. Should you have any accessibility issues, please send a rough private message to the host account or email webinars at ida-secretariat.org and the team will try and resolve that to the best of their abilities. We request all speakers to kindly keep to times and ensure that they speak slow enough for the interpreters and captioners to follow. We would like to thank the logistics and communication teams at the International Disability Alliance for their hard work and consideration in enabling this participation for all of us here today. We will now start our roundtable with the theme of stigma and discrimination as barriers to inclusive education. Hello everyone, my name is Feng Nguyen, also known as Crystal Nguyen. I am a performing artist and student living on Wachuk Nungan Buja land. I live with a disability and I am based in Australia. Before we begin the last session, before we begin this session, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that I am speaking on, the Wachuk people of the Nungan Nation, and I pay respect to elders past and present here and on the respective lands that all of our participants are tuning in from. It is my honor to be your moderator for today's session. Thank you all for taking the time out of your Valentine's Day to be with us today. I hope that this next 90 minutes will be worthwhile. I would like to remind you once again that closed captioning remain available throughout the sessions. And we also have translations into Chinese and interpretation in inter international sign. I'm eager to start and hope you're all excited as well. Before we hear from our four dynamic youth leaders from India, the Philippines, Indonesia, and Mongolia, I would like to briefly talk about the chosen theme of this session today. As people with disabilities and young people with disabilities, we can face multiple forms of discrimination, which may lead to our exclusion from society and from school. Stigma and, stigma and discriminatory language and attitudes towards us is one of the many factors that compound the challenge we face in accessing formal or informal education. To build, while lack of access to school is an issue, an equal concern is the inability of the education system to ensure that we all have a quality education. To build a truly inclusive education system, stigma in the classroom needs to be addressed as well. While the Convention of the Rights of the Child and Education for All framework aim to meet all these learning needs of children and youth, um, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities recalls these obligations and further specifies that states parties shall take all necessary measures to ensure the full enjoyment by children with disabilities of all human rights and fundamental freedoms on an equal basis with other children. And they ensure an inclusive education system at all levels and lifelong learning. Now, without further ado, let's take the opportunity to hear from our four young persons with disabilities on the panel today and see how they have experienced stigma and discrimination in the context of education, but also how they got where they are now and what's their story. 
Let's welcome to the panel, Kavya, Marcus, Surya, and Timulen. Hi, everyone. I'm so sorry we can't be in person together, but this will have to do. <laughs> um, let's get started. My first question for us is whether you can briefly tell us who you are and introduce what experience on this topic brings you to the panel today. Would anyone like to start? Hello, everybody. May I speak? My name is Timulin. I'm representing Mongolia. And uh, and um, my disability is the cerebral lapsy. And um, I work at the Universal Progress Independent Living Center as an education manager. And uh, I have been doing training at the disability education training um, um, to promote a positive understanding of the disability. And um, I have been working on this current position for four years as an educational manager. During these four years, Within um, Mongolia, I have provided training to uh, uh, trainings. And then also, as far as the policy in Mongolia, um, I have been working on the particular uh, policy of the, the disabled people. Um, however, um, the understanding, awareness on disability, as far as the actual policy, as well as um, public awareness and pair parent awareness are not developed within this topic, leveraging my own personal experience. I have conducted trainings, discussion and workshops uh, to government um, workers and uh, as well as parents within the last five years, we have conducted uh, trainings to for approximately 13,000 people. And the reason why we are um, bringing up this educational is issue in Mongolia is that first of all, quality education is not very reachable to disabled um, youth. Second of all, the ability to earn general education as far as the elementary, middle, or high school education is not sufficient enough. So that's why it would be not reachable or easy for disabled youth to um, enter to universities and um, so they can have better life. And therefore, I wanted to work on this particular topic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tamerlan, for sharing. 
Um, how about uh, Kavya? Can we hear from Kavya? Oh, hi, everyone. So as you all know, I'm Kavya Mukija and I'm a student of psychology. I'm pursuing my master's in applied psychology, but unfortunately I cannot read your minds. Um, apart from that, I'm also a disability rights advocate and I'm pursuing a fellowship program, the NCP EDP Javed Abidi Fellowship at the National Center for Promotion of Employment for Persons for Disabled People. And today I will be taking you all um, down a ride through my school life, um, which was uh, packed with a lot of experiences, both happy and sad, um, because a uh, right to education is very important. And if there is no inclusive education right from the beginning, it impacts an individual's entire life. So I think we will have a lot of engaging discussions and I'm happy to be here today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kavya. That was really beautiful. Um, let's hear from Marcus. Hello. Can you tell us a bit Hello. about yourself and why you are here on this panel today? Hello, Crystal. Hello, everyone. Good morning from Rosani, Philippines. I am Marcus Operiano, and I am a disability rights advocate as well. Same with Kavya here in my country. I was born with uh, mild cerebral palsy. And what brings me to this panel is also my first-hand experience of stigma and discrimination when it comes to education and besides from a stigma and discrimination with my disability, I was also ridiculed uh, because of my sexuality. So I've faced double back, uh, a double uh, form of discrimination in school. And this is something that I would like to share with the panel and the, with the participants. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcus. And last but not least, our final uh, speaker on the panel today, Surya, would you like to say hi to everyone? Hi, everybody. Good morning. Or uh, good evening to all of you, because we're coming from the different parts of the world. Hi, nice to meet you, everybody. Um, Crystal um, and the rest of the panelists. So my name is uh, Surya. This is my sign name. I'm, I'm from Indonesia. And um, now I, I live in the capital city of Jakarta, but currently I'm studying at the Rochester Institute of Technology here in New York. So this is um, and the National Technical Institute for the Deaf. I'm, I'm learning to be a, trained to be a teacher. So I'm doing a master's now in a science education, master in science and second, secondary education for the deaf and the hard of hearing. So at the same time, I've set up an organization that's a sign name, it's called Handai Tuli. Handai Tuli means literally friends of the deaf in an Indonesian language, which is to help that uh, for the deaf and hearing community to be able to be bridged and to learn to communicate and to um, learn from each other's world, the culture and to socialize as well as to learn from each other. So I'm very excited to be here, to be part of the panelists, to, um, to talk about education and the importance of it. So it's a very um, honorable um, um, invitation that I've, in, uh, that I've received today and I'm very happy to be with all of you today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Surya. Um, I would love to ask this second question to Kavya and hopefully to Temulin, if you guys are up to it. Um, you were rather young when you started being an advocate for disability inclusion, in my understanding. Um, and if either of you are uh, comfortable to share a personal experience, um, would you like to speak about a time when you have faced stigma or discrimination that kept you from accessing education on an equal basis with other youth with disabilities. And um, another uh, throng of the question is who or what helped you overcome these barriers and get to where you are now with your brilliant selves? Would, you, would we like to start with maybe Kavya? Oh, uh, sure. Thank you so much for that question. Um... So my first ever brush with discrimination in the form of, in the uh, educational sector was when um, I was young. My parents were trying to get me admitted into a school, and all the schools in my city denied uh, taking me in because 
uh, only because I was disabled and I could not walk. So I think this was my first ever uh, tryst with um, discrimination. And at that time, even the law was not that strong but that could have, you know, backed us up and provided us legal support. But then um, my parents were really determined because uh, they believed that, um, you know, education is everything. If you're educated, you're empowered. And I think there has been a technical issue where Kavya has lost. Yeah, Kavya's screen is frozen. Yeah, I think that yeah. Is oh, yeah. yeah but I, I think we can still hear you. Would you mind repeating the last sentence that you were, were saying? Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, it's okay. So uh, where uh, did you hear me last? Um, I think we got to where your parents were determined to get you a proper entry to education yeah right uh, so i mean i think that is why i'm here today and um, you know if you are educa educated you have awareness about what's right what's wrong and you know you can uh, sort your way thereafter thank you absolutely i totally relate to that i have a similar experience growing up and always have to fight for my space in the room um, with non-disabled people as well so i totally echo that and i'm sure that a lot of participants here can relate to your story um what about Timulin? what's your story and how did you overcome your barriers to become who you are now As far as my personal experience, since I was two years old, I have been attending to special uh, education daycare and also special education schools. And the reason why I had to attend to special education, special uh, schools were um, when I was um, small, and even the generation before me, in Mongolia, the people with uh, dis disabled people did not have the equal legal or um, health or social environment for us to attend to normal schools or normal um, uh, places like other kids. And second, even though there were schools I can attend, the administration of those schools refused to work with me or the reasons where they did not have enough staffs or uh, teachers who can work with me and they uh, they would say I cannot work with this type of children so therefore um, I've enrolled into special education daycare um, and then I uh, obtained um, only the daycare education until I was 11 years old. Uh, um, however, kids my age would be able to start school at age seven or eight, but I couldn't. I had to stay at the special education daycare and it was labeled under special education or uh, uh, that I can only attend to special education schools. And during the, this period, uh, the first two to three years were very pleasant. There were uh, classes were taught clearly. And then from the third and fourth year, honestly, the education that I was receiving or the standard or the range of information uh, that we were being educated were not enough. 
the time I was a small child, I didn't have enough information. Um, and um, I just thought that's how it's being taught. And then um, the special education schools also had their own separate unique programs for disabled kids, uh, which is what we found out later. What that meant was that the program was very much light, lighter than the general education that kids our age would receive. For example, when I was uh, at the first grade, uh, I'm sorry, when I was on, at the eighth grade, um, my program that I was receiving or education that I was receiving was equivalent to third or fourth grade of the general um, uh, school um, or school program. Therefore, it made it very difficult for disabled um, uh, kids to um, eventually enroll into universities. Um, and we did not have um, sufficient uh, education or abilities to take care of our family. Therefore, I wanted to uh, work and contribute my myself into this educational um, matter in this sector. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Timulin, for sharing your story. And it also really speaks to your personal resilience as we all here can feel that through the screen. Um, Surya, you have also been a disability advocate for a while and you've aimed specifically to bring the deaf and hearing community together in my understanding. Um, so I have a question for you. If one day you were to become the prime minister of, no, sorry, the minister of education in your country, and you could make, you could implement sustainable systemic changes, what would be the most critical change that you want to make to tackle the issue of stigma and discrimination in education? Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful question. Perhaps I will just give an explanation of some of the background that I have in terms of the uh, education to, for the integrated education that we have in Indonesia. Right. Um, so, for example, in the past, I, I was interested in football and I wanted to actually um, be part of a football team. But uh, during the team, the coach actually threw a soccer boot at me because he said that, no, why did you throw a boot at me? You know, I, I was like, because he said, I tried calling for you, but you couldn't, uh, you couldn't hear me, but I'm deaf. So that led me to think about there's probably a lot of um, misunderstanding ab about how the deaf and the hearing could communicate. So coming to RIT, the Rochester Institute, I was able to communicate through signs and it becomes a very ease of communication with people. And I see that even the deaf people, they could actually use the phone, that's it. Yeah, we could use sign language and we could communicate you know, very easily with everyone. So that's that's when I begin to realize the importance of sign language education and importance of having everyone being understand the need of the deaf in terms of the communication needs through sign language. And I hope that you know sign language will be taught at schools and will be more trained whereby we have teachers who are skilled in sign language to be in the school education setting to teach sign language and for the deaf and the hearing students alike be able to communicate via this language. So this is the world that I would hope to see and this is the, some of the changes that I would like to see in the government whereby we will be able to have sign language education, sign language as a means of communication for all. And so it's, this has to start from a early stage of education, whereby we will need to see and understand that you know, education and sign language program, it's necessary for the deaf and also be able to integrate the, us into society because this is a way that I, I see how and um, using sign language as a means to, and when I see that this as this develops, when people come together, whether they are hearing impaired, they are deaf, or they have um, other 
communication needs. Sign language can be a mean for us to communicate with each other, regardless of whether we are hearing or we are deaf. Thank you so much, Sharia. I totally and absolutely agree. I hope that we have a world where sign language is integra integrated as a mainstream language and even compulsory within education with neurotypical or neurodivergent and um, tired of hearing or disabled children. That would be amazing and that would be the utopic, utopic world that we, that we need. Thank you. All right, um, Kavya, I'd like to ask if you share the same sentiments with the previous speakers, or would you have a different strategy if you were uh, the Minister of Education and you want to make critical change? Um, of course, I agree with Surya. And in addition to that, I would also ensure that, you know, now that we do not see a lot of people with disabilities in schools, we hardly see any um, persons with disabilities in schools, in mainstream schools. And if, uh, and I believe that if we were to have, a, in, have an inclusive society, we need to see uh, persons with disabilities in schools as well. And to accommodate that, I would ensure that at least uh, ten percent of every class has disabled people, you know, because unless and until we include them, we will not know what their needs are. So actually, there's a communication gap, I believe. Unless and until we communicate and talk, we will not know where, you know, that where the gap exactly is. So I would ensure that. And apart from that. Sports is often considered a non-disabled uh, thing. You know, if you're a wheelchair user, you cannot play sports. You cannot engage in any uh, sports activity. So I would also, um, you know, make it mandatory to have inclusive sports wherein all people can play whatever they feel like. You know, if someday I want to play football, I'm a wheelchair user, so I should be able to do that. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Kavya. That um, is the perfect segue into our next section of our session, which is when we talk about advocacy for inclusion. Before this, let me invite you all and our participants to watch a brief video with young people with disabilities from around the world explaining what inclusion means to them. This video features audio description, captions and ISL and was produced by UNICEF in 2015. Enjoy. Statements from children and young people with and without disabilities. My dream for inclusion is that all children and young people should be involved in every decision that affects their lives. I think of people with disabilities actively communicating and participating with other students, having the same resources and opportunities to, to basically succeed and have a holistic education as others, rather than simply being in the school for the sake of being there. The way I personally understand inclusion, inclusion is uh, where we make sure we remove all the barriers that uh, you know persons with disability face. The attitude of the people is to change. Because the attitude barrier is the most important. I would like to advocate for children with disabilities. Ensure that persons with disability rights are promoted and protected. Build the capacities of youth to become as leaders. Talk with government on education. Community sensitization about causes of disabilities and what kind of support is needed. Now adapting the environment in the schools. Enrolling children with disabilities into regular school, thereby promoting inclusive education. People will learn a lot because I know many people who are not disabled but they are very inspired from people with disabilities. Regardless of disability, gender, ethnicity, language and religion. We should always be included in everything. Inclusion means be brave. As Maya Angelou once said, in diversity there is beauty and there is strength. UNICEF and the Global Partnership on Children with Disabilities. With special thanks. 
to Australian aid. Wow, what a walk down memory lane. I think I, I spot some familiar faces there. <laughs> Hi, Marcus. Um, may I ask you, just to segue from that video, since you have been an advocate already in 2015, um, to make people care about stigma and discrimination as barriers of education and to really create an uh, inclusive society, which advocacy tips do you wish to share with us? And it could be, it could be for youth, for the community, or for the people in the government. Take it away. I've always believed in the power of storytelling. I think stories give us some inspiration, gives us um, the right perspective on things. It gives us some motivations. Um, it also fire us. Uh, it also fires us when it comes to our rage, when it comes to the problems in the society. But I believe that in with the disability sector, we should really work on uh, still as I, I as I also consider that uh, we still have a long way to go when it comes to uh, full inclusion of people with disabilities. And by that, I think that disability awareness is still needed in our society. And uh, we can do that by sharing more stories of people with disabilities, sharing the struggles, not just the, the triumphs, but also the struggles, the, the, the barriers that we face every day. And I think that um, with, with, with the right uh, awareness raising that we can do for our society, in our schools, in our workplaces, we could um, gather more advocates in the sector and also um, inspire these people to also work for the also uh, work with us when it comes to our advocacy. So I think that awareness raising is really the first step for us to achieve inclusion. Thank you, Crystal. Absolutely, nothing about us without us, right? And um, as a as a performer, I definitely relate to this because. I always strive to be involved in projects where disability is represented as incidental and it's just who we are and we're just in society as we are. And that's, I think our existence is a political statement itself. Um, and with allies, we can truly make a difference. Um, thank you for your optimism and resilience. Um, Timulin, let's um, discover and explore some of your ideas on effective advocacy. I would love to hear from you. Is it still me? In my opinion, children with uh, disabilities being involved is not just a problem of uh, the disabled children. It's a problem or issue to be solved by everyone in the society. Why I think that way? First of all, children with disability from starting uh, from the kindergarten, if they go to school together with the rest of the kids, with the uh, kids without disability, this will be a great opportunity for those who have no disability to understand them better and to accept them in the society. And if they have that heart and understanding and acceptance of those uh, around them, they will continue being uh, the, the, the people with the right uh, understanding and conception. And that will greatly help with those who with disabilities when they graduate from school, go into the society to go to get a job, they will be well received. I'm sure there will be lots of problems uh, they need to um, overcome, but it will be less uh, challenging uh, because the people around them understand them and accept them and uh, from, because they know those people from the very early childhood. And uh, in my opinion, that will 
uh, substantially reduce the gap in the, uh, in the misunderstanding between the disabled and abled children. And, and I'm sure there is a lot to do for the government uh, because the society and the government uh, combined together, they have to raise the awareness uh, about disabled children and their parents because parenting is the most challenging part for uh, those who have disabled children. Uh, in the society, there is a misconception that family with the uh, disabled children is a low class or poor people or not um, adequate to come full, to live full life in the society. And But we can erase this um, stigma uh, just by involving everyone from the early childhood in the kindergarten, having them next to their uh, all of the children with no disabilities. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was really powerful. Um, we are reaching the final question for this panel, panel, or rather the official questions, and we will move on to Q&A after this. Um, since its ratification in 2006, the Convention of the Rights of People with Disabilities urges states, parties to ensure an inclusive education system at all levels and ensure lifelong learning. There are countries and communities where this has been implemented well. Um, I guess this next question is for you, Surya. Um, how has the field of education for youth with disabilities changed? since the ratification of Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and what do you personally predict will happen in the next five to 10 years? Since the ratification of the uh, UNCRPD. So I see that in Indonesia, for example, we actually ratified in 2011, and as a, and it's become a national law in, um, since then. So what we see that the changes that we have um, witnessed within the government itself is that we have more now uh, um, sign language interpreters in television. The acceptance of the deaf students has become um, uh, becoming more and more, um, um, we see more opportunities are given to the deaf community in deaf students. And I see that, the, the interest among the hearing people to learn sign language has also increased because, and I see government and also companies, part of private sectors are more willing now to actually have um, hearing or deaf people, which was difficult in the past. Though, in, you know, for example, sign language could be a, a challenge or barrier in the past. But now with this, with education, with students being able to reach them, um, the deaf students are able to reach a higher education level. We see that they're more and more getting coming into the uh, workforce and uh, companies are more willing to accept them. So I think what's important is that this open up the door to work together to actually promote the use of sign language. The awareness has increased since then. And we see that this has been incorporated into ed the education system, whereby um, more and more acceptance are being seen for the deaf community. Thank you so much, Surya. That was beautiful. Um, how about Kavya? What do you predict will happen in the next five to 10 years for inclusion for us all? Um, I think we would start seeing more and more people with disabilities. And now that there are so many advocates and you know it has become a global, um, you know, it's a it's like a global wave that has come up of access, inclusion, and awareness. So I think there would be more people with disabilities out there. Um, teachers also play a very important role in including people with disabilities because it's not you know inclusive education is not just limited to uh, giving admission to students with disabilities. They have to be made feel included as well. So I think teachers would start becoming more and more aware because there is now a lot of emphasis on uh, invisible disabilities as well. And there are a lot of teachers who are taking this up uh, as their 
professional careers so i think there will be a 360 degree change in near future hopefully yeah i hope so too <laughs> how about you marcus this is a big question but dream as much as you want um, yeah what do you predict will happen in the next 5 and 10 years i really think that um i hope i'm hoping and i'm really optimistic that um uh, ministers of education will be more uh, accepting to people with disabilities I, in the context of the philippines um i hate to say this but inclusive education is and education as a whole is one of the neg neglected um programs for people with disabilities um a lot of children with disabilities aren't aren't in schools but i think in the next 10 years because of our advocacy because of what we're doing because of the rage of the sector i think that we'll have more better policies because i think that policies that reflect the the norm in in our of our society and also the dignity of our society so i am really hoping that inclusive education would be a norm rather than just a separate uh type of education but it, it should be the norm in the next 10 years thank you so much let's pass this on to timulin what do you think for the five to ten years um even though it seems like it's a long time um for the actual execution of the change or implementation it's not long enough first of all i have to my in my opinion our society has to change and accept that the uh, youth with a disability must uh, earn education and prepare teachers and instructors who can work with those children specifically and also te prepare all the teachers any teachers should have awareness and understanding and education about um, disabled youth. That's the system that I want. Thank you. That's lovely. Thank you so much. Um, we are, we still have ample time, so I'm, I'm happy to chat a little bit more with you folks. Um, Kavya, Marcus, Surya, and Timulin, we have really felt your strong commitment to disability rights agenda, and we want to applaud your engagement for today. Um, next up, I would like to invite you all to watch a visual story by Katik Shani. Um, let's one second i'm just finding my notes <laughs> um so this video is a story of his personal experience and i would love for you all to watch it he's a young person with visual impairment from india and he shares how he had to tackle ignorance on disability in the classroom this video is recorded and made into a one minute cartoon which is really exciting Let's um let's enjoy it. A statement by Kartik Sawney, a 19-year-old boy from India who is blind, illustrated by animation. When I was in grade 10, uh, one of my teachers uh, did not quite know how I worked, and uh, I told him about my disability and the assistive technology that I use in the beginning of the year. And at the end of the year, he tells me that I got a zero out of a 10 in my class participation. And I was actually shocked. When I asked him the reason, he was like, well, you don't listen to what I say in the classroom. You always have your earphones on and you listen to music rather than concentrating in my class. So how do I give you a 10? And that is when I again explained him what screen reader actually meant. Even then, he was like, your keyboard does not have braille. How do you know what you're typing? You're fooling me and you cannot fool me. 
And then finally, I had to show them this article on Wikipedia describing what a screen reader is and showing him like pictures of blind people actually typing on the computer and actually demonstrating that yes, I could actually type even without vision. So. Thank you. I really enjoyed that. Kartik's <laughs> um, storytelling is so animated. Um, do you, I guess this is a question from me, just uh, Crystal to you. Um, do you, does any of the participants have a funny story in the classroom that turns out hilariously like that? <laughs> I know that I personally have a lot of stories where um, in for my formative years, like year one to five, I couldn't really use the student bathroom because they were completely inaccessible. And there were days where I literally had to wear a diaper and wait for my parents to pick me up and do my business at home. And that, that has always been, like at the time it wasn't funny, but in hindsight, now that I'm an adult, I think it's really hilarious that I had to do that. <laughs> yeah, how about any of our uh, speakers? Anyone has a funny story about your time at school? <laughs> Feel free to turn on your mic and just speak. Surya. One story to share here. So I remember that when I was in, at school, it was an integrated school that I was attending. So there was, um, because uh, there was no interpreter at school. So my teacher was teaching in class and I was like, he forgot that I was staff. He kind of like overlooked that fact. So she was, she was just writing and speaking, facing the board, writing and writing. I was like, what was happening? What's going on in school? And my friends were like, uh, they were like, hey, hey, teacher, teacher, please, please turn around. Don't speak to the board because, you know, we have a deaf student uh, in, among us. So I was like, I just, I, I was just observing their behavior. And so that was really funny because my friends actually spoke up for me and told oh, the teacher said, I'm really sorry that I know I, I forgot that. And then, and then again, she was like, very, she became more cautious of that, that she wouldn't speak to the board whenever she explains something. And she would turn around after knowing that um, little incident that happened. That's a little funny, funny story that I'd like to share. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's so funny. Sometimes um, teachers do have the best intentions, but they just don't know what to do. <laughs> um, anyone else? I think Timulin raised his hand. <laughs> okay. As for me, this occurred when I was in university, right after I started the university. And then our university is an older style, was located in an older style building. And uh, we did not have a, a bathroom for disabled students, especially the one with the wheelchair. So when I leave in the morning, I would have very little liquid intake. I would just limit my water. And at the time, two of our um, classmates were arguing and I heard that the argument and what they were arguing was that they were arguing whether I could um, actually go to bathroom or not uh, anatomically. The reason is, uh, the reason is, uh, again, I would limit my liquid intake a lot and I would just avoid going to a bathroom. And even if I had to go to a bathroom, I would uh, leave the school and then, um, you know, go and do my business uh, uh, because I couldn't um, uh, go to bathroom on my own. My family members would be waiting for me outside. It would help me to go to bathroom. Even though those uh, um, the classmates were arguing and the, the, it wasn't their fault. Um, first of all, I they never saw me going to bathroom. 
Uh, so that's why it wasn't their fault. Okay. Oh, that is so funny. I think that I had the exact same experience at some point where I was just like, no water, I'm fine. My kidneys can take it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I have another question before we uh, wrap up and um, take it to the audience and take some Q&A questions. I think this is just from me, Crystal, uh, as a performer and disability advocate in the arts. Um, any of you have any movies or pieces of writings or songs or authors, any pieces of art that have gotten you through hard times in school when we felt isolated and misunderstood? And if you could share that with us that and with me, I would really, really appreciate that. Is it, um, I see Kavya has her hand up. Is it for this question or was it for the funny experience in school? Uh, it was for, it is for both actually. Yeah, sure, um, take it away. Yeah, so can I share a funny incident as well? Of course. Okay. Um, so, you know, a lot of times people assumed that if I'm a wheelchair user, I'm also someone who cannot speak or cannot hear and whenever they would you know see me talking or doing things that everyone else did they would be sort of amused they would be shocked you know that the, the, there was surprise on their face that oh you can do this as well wow that's so amazing so I mean this is pretty hilarious um, and um, could you please repeat the next question yeah, sure. The, the second question that I have for the panelists is, do you have a piece of art, either a song, a movie, a TV show that have helped you gotten through dark times when you were in school and felt isolated or, yeah, has, has given you hope to, to keep going? Right. Thank you so much for reiterating that. Um, and... So I found this book uh, called Wonder by R.J. Palacio. And uh, I found this much later after I completed uh, my school. And there has never been a similar piece as that. It is such a homely feeling to read that because the experiences of the protagonist um, echo with my experiences so much. And if you guys have not read that, I would... Uh, really encourage everyone to read that book. It's really wonderful. I have read that book and I've watched the movie for it as well. It's a really beautiful story about a boy with physical differences and being integrated and included in a mainstream school, right? Thank you so much. Um, anyone else have a piece of art that they would like to share? Can I share yeah. a story? Yeah. Oh, story. Yes, of course. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So for me, it was like a still on my youthful days where, you know, studying was quite a challenge. So I was, when I went to school, when I first, when I read books or movies, as you know, that it's like it, it, there was this person I really like, uh, Helen Keller, that really inspired me. Her, her, her story. So a deaf blind person, her story, her biography really inspired me. And another person was um, Thomas Alvedin. All right. These two are my favorite authors and uh, because they have given me a lot of inspiration about the challenges that they felt in school, about education. And those books has been and the movie, both of it, has actually been a source of inspiration for me to persevere in finding a path in whatever I do and in continue to push forward what I have been doing all these years. Absolutely. I am also very inspired by Helen Keller's story. I remember when I was about eight, my mom got me a comic book about her and they illustrated her journey from going to school or with sharing with family and having a personal interpreter and all that. And it was just really touching. Thank you for sharing that. 
Um, is it Timulin that wants to share a piece of art that has helped you through hard times at school? I would like to talk about two things. First one is uh, the the system that developed me to live um, in Mongolia. The, the person's name is Ondrach Bayer with the with the with the help of it i've learned about this how to live independently and uh, what's the um the specifics about the disabled person um how we can learn to live independently so that was the concept that i've learned from this person and then secondly, I there's a movie that I really like. This, uh, this is an American movie. K Kumas You Are is the name, a title of the movie. And this is the movie about the three guys what the, that is blind and the, that has a um, terrible um, disability and um, and then they are in, on a journey to uh, find um, or um, find their sexuality and uh, that when I watched that movie it dawned on me that this is they are exactly pointing to the issues that we we encounter. That's it. Absolutely. It's really important to see us represented on screen stage and in the arts because that's where we come to when we want to find comfort, right? And we want to see a diverse world that is, is truly represented as we are. Um, Marcus, do you have any song, movie, series that you want to recommend to us? Uh, yeah, but uh, but I haven't watched it when I was a kid. But um, recently, I just watched a series called Special on Netflix, and it really mirrored the, the realities of people with cerebral palsy like me, and uh, as a queer person as well. I really love that film. I, I think that I saw, finally, I saw that representation of mine on Netflix, and I'm really, really excited to share it with the other friends in order for them to also understand the plight of people like me who are queer and disabled. And I think that uh, that's what we need. We, we need representation in media in order for other people who, doesn't, who don't have disability should know, um, who, who, they would know um, more stories of people with disabilities, more funny stories, more motivational stories for people with disabilities, and also that um, the mere representation shows that we people exist and that's what matters and that we, we should be, we should not be um, treated as like um, a, a different person, but we exist and we should be, and we should be existing. Absolutely, Marcus. I love that um, series special on Netflix. It was really, really hilarious. I finished season one, I think. Um, for me, I totally relate. And um, as a performing artist, I try to get involved in projects that highlight disability as just an incidental thing, not the whole story arc. Um, I used to audition for this show called Raising Dion. And I didn't get it, but the person that get it, got it was this really beautiful young lady using a wheelchair who got the, I guess, the best friend role. And she also had riddle bones, um, my condition. And it's just really such a joy to see positive representation and not just look how hard we have, how much hardship we're going through. It's about the joy and disabled 
authenticity there as well. Um, all right, before we wrap up, let's just get to the Q&A session. I see that a lot of audience members today are keen to reach out and ask their questions to the panelists. Let me invite you to um, meet or virtually meet my colleague, Leva. She will be reading out some of the questions from our audience today. Take it away, Leva. Hi, Crystal. Hi, panelists. There's many questions coming in and I see two questions that are related. Also, Marcus, to the story that you have been sharing. So specifically, a person is asking, how has being queer and disabled impacted your interactions with or belonging to the queer and disability communities respectively? And the person asking is also a queer disabled person. And then if you can answer that question, Marcus, but we also would like to hear from the other panelists how you have integrated people with, let's say, multiple discriminations, disability being one, but other aspects of discrimination, how you have integrated people in your advocacy work? For me personally, um, being a member of both sectors, I actually gained more friends because I have fr friends from the LGBTQIA sector, I have friends from the disability sector, so it, it, it impacted me tremendously. Um, but also, I feel that I have more responsibility when it comes to raising awareness to these people. That um, when I hang out with my gay friends, for example, they don't know much about disability, so I have to tell them about it. When I hang out with disabled people, I have to tell more about uh, the LGBTQ spectrum. So it really impacted me in the sense that these are people whom I could persuade to also join the advocacy, and also these people um, I could make them. Um, educated about the struggles of the sector, which uh, the, the barriers of the sector that needs to be addressed. These people are working in government, uh, working in uh, holding high positions in the private sector. And I think that they could also uh, have power for, for in the society. And then they could also have the fair share of removing the barriers that that's continually disabling the people like us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcus. Can I can I chime in? I think that question is really great. <laughs> um, I really, really relate to how you said, the more the merrier. I just have a lot of more friends with the different intersections of, of disabilities and marginalized communities. Um, as a member of the LGBTQIA plus um, community myself, I find that it's really uplifting and refreshing to, I guess, exist in those sectors and support these um, stereotypes from people. Um, I think that it's a really heartwarming thing knowing that you can be a lot of things and you will be, you will find support and belonging in different groups as well. Um, but yeah, thank you, Leva. Are there any other panelists who would like to speak about the multi multiple discriminations and how in your agenda of advocacy, you ensure that it's not just about disability, but also including different um, agendas of discrimination amongst the people with disabilities? Surya, I think your hand's up. Would you like to speak? So working in my place, we, uh, we open our services to all people. So not, not discriminating in terms of what, um, whether they are deaf with other disabilities of, or other, you know, belonging to other social groups. So for, for us, right, sometimes when we meet them, we explain to them about the different situations, about, you know, having to communicate why the need of, um, for education to use a sign language and to provide accessibility, going to the office, for example. So sometimes when we meet people, they, they may not know how to actually um, communicate with us. So prior to that, we will send emails to them to 
tell them about our needs and then also to inform them uh, via PDF uh, document to know how they actually um, have the so that, and when we make the explanation to them, they are able to understand a bit even better of how to actually um, talk to us, how to communicate with us without any sense of discrimination. So having to meet these people and to of, from various walks of lives, having been able to meet them and talk to them whether they are blind or different sectors or different parts of society, being able to use sign language and also written communication and to explain to them to about our situations, regardless of our background, it actually helps to reduce the discrimination that is um, that has been ongoing. It can actually reduce discrimination um, to a certain extent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Surya. Do we have another question? Yes, the questions are coming in. Um, just scrolling through and picking a good one. Sorry, <laughs> there's many questions coming in. Um, cool. Everyone's so excited to talk to you. Yes. Okay, we have a very interesting question saying, what will you suggest to those people who say that we do not practice accessibility because we have nobody with disabilities. And so they ignore that people might not want to communicate about their disability or have a hidden disability. So what would be your suggestion? Kavya, I see you've raised your hand. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Um, so I think for those who do not practice accessibility, I would like to tell them that you need to up your, uh, you know, awareness game because not practicing accessibility does not mean that people with disabilities will vanish from this planet. They will still exist and they will still use your services. And it is you who is on the loss because you will... Um, I mean, your profit will go down. There's so many people with disabilities. So not providing accessibility is like, uh, you know, saving yourself from uh, giving answers, not being accountable. So I think there has to be more awareness. Business owners or, you know, services owners, service providers have to know that of how they can make uh, their services and everything accessible, how, what kind of people exist out there and what are their unique needs. And they should be able to accommodate that into whatever they're doing. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Universal access benefits everyone, not just the people in the disability community. Right, Kavya? Absolutely. Um, anyone else would like to answer this? Oh, Temulin, I think you're, you've raised your hand. Yeah. Yes, I have. I, I'm, I'm, I, I agree with Kavya what she said because uh, to provide awareness to those people. First of all, uh, people with disabilities, they, of course, haven't cho chosen to be that way. They were not born that way. Of course, this is when we were born, we didn't choose this uh, path of uh, life at all. And uh, disability is... Uh, It's, it's not a separate issue in the society. It's just disparity uh, in many areas. It, that, it regard, it's uh, just a, a difference in a human being, just like whether you can sing well or to pitch a right uh, note in singing, uh, whether you're tall or short. So it's just a difference in the um, 
a human being and individual. And because of that, uh, my disability is my wheelchair, not my disability. And then, of course, um, in order to be able to do the things you want to do and achieve the things you plan, of course, you need the personal assistance. That's very important that uh, um, you have some assistance available when you need it. And then, of course, you have to make yourself clear and uh, understandable to others. It's not just my problem. Uh, I'm sure this problem exists now and then in the future, we will still be facing the same problems um, to solve um, challenges that uh, people with uh, disabilities need to overcome. So it has to be institu institutional or uh, governmental effort to solve the problems uh, in the society. Thank you. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more, Timuan. Um do the Maybe remaining just, uh, comments that uh, has been provided um, by Kavya Purnima Bala Jepali, who is herself a person with the visual impairments. And she is also emphasizing that accessibility needs to come from the design phase as well. So um, it should not always be the user facing issues with accessibility. It should be understood by the designers when the issues are addressed. And that's what interested me. So she herself therefore decided to study architecture. She's graduating in architecture and she is engaged with, and the organization is called NCPEDP, but I don't know the, uh, the acronym, um, and she's working on inclusive architecture now. Wow, thank you so much, Kavya Purnima. That is beautiful. Um, and congratulations on your education. I totally agree with that, right? Um, it is the infrastructure and the owners should be also in the governmental and um, settings and not just the individual. That's That's also a couple of questions related to people who are more from resource poor context and questions about making sure that the voice is not just of people who are differently with different disabilities are included but also people from different socioeconomic statuses and other marginalities so particularly people who are uh, from more remote areas or where there's more limited internet access more limited resources does any one of the panelists would like to speak to that? That's okay. Leave I think our panelists are very inundated with questions from fans for all over the world. <laughs> um, would we like to find a different question? Okay, maybe just one point on that part of people from more remote areas, people with lower economic, with the yeah. SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, we have the Leave No One Behind agenda. Yeah. And it's really about reaching the people who are furthest behind. I myself work for the United Nations, for UNICEF, and we're still working on this agenda because it's also a learning exercise for everyone. We are trying to identify, and there was a question also about evidence-based, we are implementing research. It could be data in a household survey, but it could also be the type of um, more qualitative research to identify attitudes, discrimination, and so on. And we work with that to, in, in, to inform our programming and our policies. Um, we cannot do it alone. So we are very much looking forward to working with organizations of people with disabilities, with youth with disabilities, 
So if you are in a community where these issues are not solved, please do reach out to your local governance, to UNICEF itself, to NGOs, and raise your voice. This is an invitation to be loud and proud. <laughs> raise your voice, let us know, tell us your story. Okay, we're going to see what other questions there are. Just a second, please. Yeah, as Leva is looking for a new question, I'd like to thank UNICEF and our organizers for all the great work that you've been doing as allies to youths with disabilities. Okay, there's many, many questions and I'm just scrolling through it to pick the best one in the context of this session that is about stigma and discrimination as a barrier to inclusive education. There's also a couple of questions that relate to other aspects of inclusive education. Maybe we can touch upon it. Um, and I think, I think uh, Surya, for example, you already touched upon training people on, on sign language. So the question here, is about how would the panelists address the issue of responsibility for procuring opportunities in the classroom? Also, how much relies on the teachers gaining knowledge, training, resources to be as inclusive as possible from the onset? The question is longer, also talking about institutional gaps, but I think Let's let's take these aspects of the question about resources in the classroom being teachers with knowledge gaining, but also teaching resources. Anyone would like to start and address this question? Surya, would you like to speak to that? Sure, uh, I'm glad to take this question. So in terms of the um, resources and um, well, the various um, needs, so I'll, perhaps some um, training is one aspect that we have talked about. This teachers, for example, they need to be adequately trained on how to teach or <clears throat> deal with um, people with disability. So because awareness is important, apart from that, in terms of the um, skills, organizational skills, and I see that all, different organizations such as um, UNC, UNICF and other organizations have provided um, a lot of information and uh, tools for teachers to be able to be more aware, to, be, um, to know where to um, reach for all these resources, to help in their to become better pedagogical teachers for the various needs of the students. So I think what's important is that um, for teachers, when they come to across students who are disabled or with or autistic, etc. So how these teachers, for example, with the training that they have received, also have it was also would able to continue to increase their knowledge if they as they as they grow as they develop the experience of teaching these students. Of course, the internet is another good source of resources. And we see that um, the videos and then in, for example, for deaf, WFD, the World Federation of the Deaf, has different resources and tools that are, that are really readily available for these teachers to actually help them to have a better awareness, better grasp, and also to actually help to facilitate and also increase and develop their teaching ability for the different different um, um, needs of the students with disability. And of course, now with the uh, COVID, we can see that the use of um, um, Zoom or for or online learning, I think it's becoming a more of a greater challenge for teachers of uh, um, students with disability. So how this kind of resources as we develop with times as the 
um, changes in terms of needs, like for example, now during the pandemic, where we need to use more online teaching, are the problems that they face, how could they, how they, these teachers are able to, you know, use all this information, and also maybe there are sort of research on data and design that can be, um, that can help these teachers to become a better educators. So all these different resources and training us are important, and as and I think what's important is that they are also have to be keep up with it has to keep up with times and also the needs as the um, as society as the world progresses and changes. Thank you. Thank you, Surya. Does anyone else would like to answer this question? The same question about capacity building in the classroom resources for teachers. Hello, hi Lida. All right, I think that the procurement issue is, um, I know that we could answer this and in a more um, political sense. So I think that policies would really be um, the great avenue for us to, to answer the gaps if it comes to procurement. And uh, with the policies, if, if we've institutionalized inclusive education in our schools, I think that we could have, bet, um, everything will just follow, like from the procurement to the training of teachers, to um, the education of, the, of, of, of parents, of, of the community. And, and this is like, we involve everyone when we, when we institutionalize something. Um, the, 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 the duties, uh, the duties of the state when it comes to um, inclusive education is really, really important, and we could just realize it through uh, making better policies, and of course, in making sure that they are implemented well. Um, we should think that um, having better policies when it comes to education is not just for compliance, but also, and to make uh, and to to ascertain that we should always, always involve everyone when it comes to policy making and make sure that everyone's involved so that we could have better schools we could have better schools for everyone so yeah that's for me thank you thank you Marcus. Um, so we then... have a question in mongolian that is typed in wow. the uh, chat and i'm inviting the translator uh, we have Mongolian translation for this session to translate the question, please. Yes, please. Um, certainly. So uh, the question is, hello, everybody. Um, the, in the current society, um, some companies and entities are hiring the disabled um, people in order to get a tax advantage, um, at which and at the minimum pay, it, it causes a lot of difficulty and discrimination to the uh, person with a disability because of the discrimination and could potentially cause a lot of mental issues as well. And then also um, people with a disability who are living in a remote area um, having a lot more issues that we are not sometimes aware of it. So we have to pay better attention in order to include everybody's voice and that that reaches at the global level. Thank you. Thank you so much for the translation. So my understanding is that this person is indeed sharing experience and making a statement about um, certain policies that are implemented but are not necessarily implemented in the right way, which should be about promoting inclusion of people with disabilities, but um, there are, it's used to uh, apply tax, uh, um, sorry, tax evasion. And then um, again, it's pointed out that people with disabilities in remote areas do not have the same opportunities and that this is something we should take into consideration in our activities, in our advocacy, in our programming. Crystal, I think we'll, uh, we're coming to the end of the session. So you can help us with the closure, please. Thank you so much, Leva. And thank you to the participants as well as the panelists for such an engaging roundtable discussion. It's been an honor for me to moderate this session and meet everyone. I hope we get to 
um, congregate and meet in person uh, in, a near, in the near future. Um, before we wrap up, we would invite you to listen to a rap song created a few months ago by a unified youth pair, meaning a youth with and without intellectual disability from the Special Olympics Bharat in India at the occasion of the 2021 Youth Inclusion Summit organized by the Regional Office of Special Olympics Asia Pacific. The young rappers in the songs are named EMK and Slay V have recorded a song about what inclusion means to them. Um, and this song will conclude our session today. I hope you've had a good time. And on behalf of the organizers, I would like to thank you all again for your participation in this round table. I wish you a wonderful rest of your day. Enjoy the song. यूपी चौदह से दिल्ली एम के साथ में स्लेवी हाँ ये स्लेवी यानी फायर जैसे विद एम के वी आर यूथ पार्टनर्स फॉर स्पेशल ओलंपिक्स एशिया पैसिफिक स्ट्रेट आउट ऑफ स्पेशल ओलंपिक्स भारत सस्टेन ये आ जाता हूँ तभी मैं अब अपनी वाली बीट पे ये माइक क्या वो स्टेज क्या दुनिया में लगती आग है कसा ना जो सुना ना है बात है पुरानी ये बड़े बड़े कह गए बाकी बड़े बड़े कह गए यू विल रीड वो चिस्सो यू विल ग्रो व्हेन यू गो कीप अप ग्रो व्हिच इज लो व्हेटेवर यू वांट यू नीड टू नो व्हेटेवर यू वांट यू नीड टू नो व्हेटेवर यू वांट यू नीड टू नो ये आई एम स्लेव वी टॉकिंग अबाउट एसडीजीज sustainable that and sustainable this well being of at least to send and communities removing barriers with technologies use what you need saving for the future call it sustainable education for all progression of career improvement of health physical and mental power to the women i change this fight promotion not suppression of rights road so dark you becomes the light taking this world to a whole another height whole another height let me tell you what you create for your need all giant trees come out of small seeds words so loud might cause a stampede keep the thing in your pocket which we all call greed mother earth is crying all these species are dying people are being discriminated against inclusive education and career development is a need of this hour sustain there's a revolution for inclusion reigns with the youth approaching unification empathy always fill this empty hallways unified generation riding on these highways mk slavery brothers to the grave perfection in rap that's what we crave and engrave our names on the stones of this cave let the people come through on this path which we pave हाँ बड़े बड़े कह गए इनसे ना हो पाएगा आज हम भी यहीं खड़े हैं आज वो भी वहीं खड़े हैं फर्क बस इतना है कि जिन लोगों ने बोला था इनसे ना हो पाएगा आज वही लोग बोल रहे हैं ये पत्थर को भी चीर जाएंगे चिड़ियों से भी ऊंचा उड़ जाएंगे जब करी थी पढ़ाई उनको पास समझ में आई इंक्लूजन है जरूरी ना समझो इसको मजबूरी नहीं सोच से हम सबको समझाएंगे यह हिस्सा ना लगा यह हिस्सा सोसाइटी का ही है पढ़ाई जरूरी है कल ताकि कल्चर को बचाएं तभी तो बड़े बुजुर्ग कह गए ये बात पढ़ोगे लिखोगे तो बनोगे नवाब खेलोगे कूदोगे तो होगे कामयाब स्लेवी एम के access the right to recreation and support sustainable friendships we recognize that youth with disabilities like all youth have innate talent to be nurtured we recognize that the barriers preventing youth with disabilities from accessing community support to develop this talent 
particularly the ability to participate in cultural life, recreation, leisure, and sport, often exclude youth with disabilities from the very activities where friendships are often formed. Therefore, we commit to supporting stakeholders in creating a culture of inclusion by encouraging and providing platform, skills, and services enabling youth with disabilities to participate on an equal basis with others in recreational, leisure, and sporting activities.